Hello there, I'm Chris Heilman and this is That Web Thing, my keynote for the Reasons to be Creative Festival in Brighton, England. As there won't be any video recording and the stage would probably not sound right, I thought I'd do a quick screencast for all of you who cannot actually be at the festival and still want to see this keynote. It's also a great opportunity for me to try it out on myself. So this is a keynote. I will deviate from the normal style of presenting and not give you lots of examples and ideas and homework to do. Instead, I want you to join me in reconsidering our ways in which we deal with the thing we call the web. I was inspired by The Lost Thing by Sean Tan, which is a beautiful graphic novel that is not a loud story. It's not a story that grips you and ends with a great oh my god moment. It's actually quite anticlimactic, but it's beautiful and it's thought-provoking and I was very, very inspired by it, so have a look at it by yourself. In the book, the hero of the story finds this thing on the beach. It's a weird thing. It's massive and huge. There's bells on it and tentacles. And he doesn't, nobody else seems to see it, just him. And he doesn't know what the thing is, but the only thing he realizes, it seems a bit lost. It seems a bit, it doesn't belong anywhere. And we have the same thing with the web. This is how in the 90s people looked, uh, said what the web might look like. And I don't know what that's supposed to be, but we have the same confusion still. The web means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And we as professionals on the web should be aware of that, that there might be an uh, awareness of the web or an image of the web that we don't share with the world out there. Because we see the web as something that we want to protect and cuddle. We live and breathe the web 24-7. We actually communicate on it and bring out content and write things and upload images and videos. And we see the web as this thing that runs our lives and is a big part of our lives. For the normal part of people out there is how others see the web. It's not necessarily the same thing. A lot of people are scared of the web. A lot of people are confused by it. They think, yeah, it's cute enough, but actually it's quite scary. And what actually is it? Much like this thing here, it's like, it's cute enough, but what is that supposed to be? And a lot of people have the same thing with the web. Like the media tells them it's something scary and they just don't know how to deal with it. And a lot of people also don't see it as something real that they can touch and actually fiddle around with. So it's boring. It's not really that interesting for everybody else out there that it is for us. And that's that brings us to quality and an interesting piece of quality. So this is a website that I got sent in a mailing list the other day with the question of what do we think of it. As a professional, design savvy developer, this is actually brutal. This is an eyesore. We look at this and if you start the page here, you can see it, it is long and it has all these like really weird logos and it's in your face and the text is not really readable because the text is far too small and it has this justification going on and none of this actually is appealing to us as professional web developers. And if we look further and we scroll down, there's more and more coming, far too much information. So from a UX point of view, it's overwhelming. From a uh, typography point of view, it's just awful. And then we look, if we look at the source code of it, we think, okay, maybe there's some beauty in there. And actually, no. There's uh, background color attributes, there's margin attributes, there's lots of like visual markup, like nested tables and all kind of like banners and things in there. There's no semantics whatsoever. And for us as professionals, we're like, oh my God, this is not really anything that we could subscribe to and this should have died years ago. You see that there's not even a backend there. So everything that you click on just has an empty email that you then fill out and send the information there. And I gave this feedback and thought like, okay, this was a joke or something. And the person got really offended because that's his website. And what really threw me then is when he showed me that in the first two days, he made $250 with ad clicks on it. And in the first few months, he sold two of the houses through that website. So for us, this is a complete failure. For us, this is like, oh my God, this is not what the web should be. But if I go to my mom, for example, now and tell them how much money that person made with that website and how much money I make with my web work, she would see him as much more successful. So what we see as quality is not necessarily what everybody else out there sees as quality, but what comes out at the end of it makes it for them. This was easy to do for that person and he made a lot of money with it. This is not fair to us if you think about it, but we should be aware of that, that not everybody is doing the same things that we do. And if you think back 
there's a, a lot of web knowledge that we have that other people just don't have. We assume a lot of web knowledge in the world and we measure the systems we see with our knowledge. So we look at these websites and say like, okay, with, we, with what we know, why isn't that in there? But there's a lot of people out there that have no clue what the web is and actually consume it, but don't know how it's built up, that it's actually made up from Lego bricks that actually build websites. So that's why in Mozilla we got this webmaker.org project, which uh, means we have meetings with people and introduce them to what the web is made of and they build their first websites and they actually flay around with other people's HTML. And it's a great thing to join. So if you if you feel you know everything, go to one of those and just see how excited people are when for the first time they can see their name in a browser or they can change the background color of something. And a lot of that means that we don't do quality code but it means we get somebody to actually play with the web and become a maker of the web rather than just a consumer of the web. So for us, there's playtime all the time. We're very excited about the web and we actually want to play all the time as well. In the book, uh, the hero engages with the thing on the beach and he plays with it for a few hours and it's lots and lots of fun. It's great. That thing uh, talks, it doesn't talk to him, but it just actually engages with him and they play together and it's lots of fun to do. And we do the same on the web. We do all of the ringing of bells and blowing of whistles. There's lots of like uh, demos and uh, examples and exercises that we show each other. So we love that with the web thing. A lot of our time in the web scene is filled with demos, showcases, prototypes and designing our own blogs, online CVs and experiments. So a lot of the stuff we do that we get excited about that we see at conferences like this is just things we build for ourselves and not for end users out there. And this is a bit of an inspiration loop to me. We spend a lot of time on that. We discuss, disagree, debunk, talk and make a lot of demos. We also make bold statements and deliver sound bites that both of us and the press love. A lot of time we aim for making a bold statement to shake things up and start more discussion. And the press and we ourselves are hungry for getting more of those. So the more we actually speak about our stuff and the more we disagree with each other, the more excited we get about each other. But the outside world doesn't even understand what we're doing here. And if the thing is just an example, if it's just an exercise or a demo out there, we shouldn't spend too much time on making demos and comparing them with each other and seeing which one is faster and better if in the end no products come out of it. So in the book there's an end of playtime as well. At the end of the day he realizes out of a sudden nobody comes to claim that thing. And you just can't leave it on the beach overnight, so it's such a great thing. Why does nobody come to claim it? Why does nobody say, hey, it should come home with me? And in our world, this is always when the sentence, in the real world, comes. You know, you have discussions on mailing lists and things, and people talk about all these great new tricks in CSS that they can do, and then somebody will stand up and say, well, in the real world, we can't use that. Our clients won't support this, and so on and so forth. And it always cracks me up, because it's... Uh, that real world is the thing we should focus on from the very, very start. So in the book, uh, the hero takes the thing home and actually introduces it to his parents and then hides it in the shed and actually wants to learn more about it and realizes you can't just leave it out on the beach and when nobody claims it and it just feels lonely. So he brings it home and shows it to his friends and asks him, what do you think that thing is? And the friends just analyze it and look at it and come out like, you know what, I don't know, it just feels like a lost thing to me. We should do the same with the web. The web is ours. We are the people who build it and we create wonderful things with it. We have to give it 100% if you want to be professional about it. Playing with it and telling each other how creative we are is just not enough. We need to bring this to our delivery cycles. So build things for clients, build real products with it, and don't build another demo showcase that show of a future that could happen if everything were perfect. It will never be perfect. We just need to build more things and prove in a real environment what we're doing here. We need to give it 100%. And giving 100% is an interesting concept at times. There's a lot of people say, if you want to be 100%, you have to have certain things. So let's try that out. If we say that A is 1 and B is 2 and C is 3, we can actually take a word and see how many percent of 100% we get. So a lot of people say, if you want to build things on the web and you want to give it 100%, what you need is knowledge. 
Well, knowledge gets to gets you there 73% of the way. So that's good. That's not a bad thing, but it's not quite there yet. Other people say hard work is a big thing. Hard work gets you there 75%. That's even better, but it's still not quite 100%. And of course, the big thing is like being a ninja, being like an awesome JavaScript developer, that gets you up to 86%, which is good too, but not quite 100%. The only thing that gets you there 100% is actually attitude. And that's an interesting concept if you think about it, because there's good attitudes and there's attitudes for the sake of attitudes. So celebrated attitudes, the things that people talk about, the things that we retweet, the things that we blog about, are the people that have attitudes like that. One of them is setting a new baseline. Everybody has X or Y these days. So a lot of people out there say, okay, everybody has a Retina Display iPad 3, so why should we bother supporting old browsers? Or why should we support things that don't have Retina Displays out there? If that's true, I don't think so, but it's an interesting concept to make. And it's, it's, it's something we want to achieve. We want to have that. So having an attitude like everybody has this and all who is not of my... Uh, or doesn't believe the same things is actually someone of the past, will get you a lot of applause and will cause a lot of uh, retweets and blogging and all kind of things. Being clever and innovative is another attitude that people cherish. Like, I try something out that nobody has done before. That's totally flaky and flawed and a, a, a stupid idea if you, if you shine a big light on it. But look what I can do. So that's uh, the cleverness of it is more important than the usefulness of it. And another attitude is to do things because they can be done. And you see a lot of that in syntax, like people, oh, I don't have to use a semicolon at the end of every line in my JavaScript because modern browsers do that anyways for me, so I can save that one character there. That's an attitude, but I don't know if it makes any sense. But the attitude will definitely get, get you a lot of uh, feedback and a lot of coverage. Assuming a perfect audience is another one that happens all the time, like good code explains itself. We don't have to have a documentation. Everybody knows what I'm doing here. I'm just the one who writes that library and everybody else could do it as well. Okay, that's an attitude to have. If it makes sense, I'm not sure about. And the other one is control. With this plugin, we can finally have kerning for each letter. A lot of the things we do in the design community is giving us control that the web doesn't give us. And we're faking it a lot. And it's interesting that we're craving that control, but it does not necessarily mean that we build something out of it afterwards. Other attitudes, which I actually approve more of, are future-proof attitudes. So one of them is designing for use. Like, no, we don't need another showcase. We don't need another demo. You don't need to redesign your blog. You have to find cool new things and great new solutions with use for clients out there. If there is a real client need that you can actually build something creative around, you're winning and everybody's winning because you have something out on the web that makes sense rather than something that was built to impress other people about our design skills. Enhancing progressively. Think of an escalator versus a lift. Like an escalator, when it breaks down, it becomes stairs. You can still walk up to the other level. It's not as convenient, it's not as beautiful, but it's still a piece of stairs. You can go up there. A lift, when it breaks down, it just sits there. It's a room that doesn't do anything for you and it doesn't help you with getting to the other level. So you always have to, run, have to build some stairs to fall back to the lift, whereas an escalator already is a stair that is just enhanced. And all of our products should be the same thing. Building for the next person is something that I think is very, very important. Don't write code for yourself that you just understand yourself. Build it for the next person that has to take away from you or take on work that you're actually giving out there. And that could be the design as well. The amount of PSDs I see without folder names or without layer names, that's just not helpful. It's really an extra step that I have to go through to understand what you've been doing before me. So think of that next person that has to take away from you. Asking for reasons is a very, very important thing as well. We're very good in our attitude of just dismissing things immediately when somebody made a slight mistake. Instead of asking why that mistake was made, a lot of time we find it was red tape or it was something in the project that needed to be done or some certain support of some certain hardware had to happen. So asking for a reason before condemning things is a really good future-proof attitude. 
Being technology agnostic is a big thing as well. I used to write in Perl, PHP, I used JavaScript, I used Pascal, all these kind of languages, and they changed constantly. So saying I know one thing and this is going to be the end of the end of knowledge and I never have to do anything else is just lying to ourselves. And best practices to me are found in use, not defined. A lot of best practices are done in talks or in blog posts. They're like, this is now a best practice. And you then ask how, and uh, why is it a best practice? It might be that it's connected to a certain project that in this case it became a best practice. But what is a great best practice for Gmail on mobile might not necessarily be a best practice for a blog or a, a brochureware site. So best practices to me come out of projects and come out of project cases and case studies, then we can actually say this is a best practice because we proved that we are, by applying this we saved so much time and so much money and so on and so forth. So in the book he takes it home and he nurtures the thing a bit and he wants to find out what it eats and he doesn't know much so in the end it turns out to be Christmas decorations that the thing eats, which is just weird, but sometimes you have to try out things. And that is also the same on the web. Sometimes we have to follow an unhealthy diet. Yes, I'm talking about flash and silver light. Sometimes we need to use these technologies to bridge a gap that native technology doesn't have yet or it doesn't come in browsers. Or if we want to support browsers that don't have these cool new things, we sometimes have to use one of these evil, evil plugin technologies. The point here is not that we condemn the technology for being evil, but we actually find use cases and ways to use that technology with these technologies and then seamlessly go into the new technologies when they are available in newer browsers or better environments. So again, we focus on the use case of it rather than focusing on the technology implementation of it. A great example of that is WebRTC now. WebRTC will allow us to actually uh, get streaming video from a camera in the browser. And that can be done in Flash now. So we can build tools and we can build solutions that need this functionality right now. And once browsers are further, we can actually just flick the switch and we're totally fine with it. In the book, he tries to actually find somebody in the end who actually would take on that thing for him. And he finds this poster by the government that actually tells him that there's a government agency dealing with lost things and he tries to deliver it there. The problem is when he delivers it there, there is a total lack of understanding. The, uh, he tries to bring it there, they ask him to fill out a, new, a lot of forms and he just does, it doesn't feel right. He just wants to put the thing there and nobody seems to want to take it on. They just say, oh yeah, we, we take things on here and don't worry about them anymore. So it just doesn't feel right for him to do that. But we do that on the web as well. A big thing that we always shout is like, someone should do something. Like, oh, we don't have forms that work across all the browsers. So the W3C should do something, or the browser makers should do something. Somebody should do something. Well, we are the ones who use that things, use these things, and we need these things. So why are we the ones that say somebody else should fight that fight for us, rather than us standing up and doing that? And it's actually worse than that, because what we really do uh, instead is we abstract things constantly. We write preprocessors, we write shims, we write polyfills, we write libraries, we write jQuery plugins for every single edge use case that we found once. And we feel good about releasing these things. We feel great because we think we released something that makes it better for everybody out there and allows us to deliver faster. The thing though is, how many of these things really get used? And it's okay if they fill a hole, if they actually means, if they, they, they solve a problem that in different browsers implementations are different, but they don't fill a hole and they don't really fill, um, build a solution around these things when they make us dependent on some different syntax that we didn't have before. So we should not replace the standards that are in the, uh, in the browsers and are not really supported yet or are still in flux with something that we just use instead of actually fixing the underlying issue. Instead, you should play with the players. I mean, this is here, my little, po my little browser ponies. 
Browsers are not the scary things on the past that nobody can touch, that are owned by some evil corporation that just does things that hates developers. All the browser makers actually are developers now, and we all understand the web, and we learn a lot from things like jQuery, we learn a lot of things like CSS preprocessors. But the point is, if you really want to make a change, if you really want to make this world better for us as developers, you have to talk to browser makers and the standards bodies. That means participating in mailing lists, this means filing bugs and not building a JavaScript library that works around the issue rather than fixing the underlying issue because you will get bored of your JavaScript library and you will not maintain it in a year's time. The browser makers will maintain their browser in a year's time and make it better for everybody out there. In essence, this means that we should go outside of our uh, comfort zone. We, 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 it, the magic happens outside of our comfort zone. So instead of talking to each other and impressing each other with demos and with libraries that solve every problem on this planet, we actually should start talking to developers of browsers. We should start talking to real clients what they want and try to put the magic of what we do in demos and experiments inside real products rather than building yet another demo out there. A great example of this has happened lately. So this is a library called uh, Photon. And Photon got released and it's basically CSS 3D transformations with uh, light sourcing on them. So this looks beautiful and I saw it for the first time and I'm like, this is gorgeous, but also really pointless. It's just invent reinventing Flash. The other thing that we have is Mozilla Popcorn. Mozilla Popcorn is a JavaScript library to actually help you control web content around a video with a video. So it actually gives you this timeline style interface that Flash had to actually say at a certain second of the video, this should happen. And it has a, it's a JavaScript library, but it also has this editor that you can play with to actually connect parts of the timeline of the video with HTML or uh, other things in the page around it. So this can be done in, in plain old JavaScript, but the, the library makes it much easier. Now the BBC took two of these things together, the Photon library and actually uh, uh, and Popcorn, to make this news page here. And this is just beautiful. This is a video underneath that actually plays and then has overlaid CSS layers that tilt the right for the right way so they actually tilt with the video there. So instead of creating a video of that whole talk and actually making it uh, play second by second, all of these labels and the arrows and stuff is actually SVG on a CSS plane with the light sourcing from Photon on top of that content. And that is just gorgeous. And it just fascinates me that nobody else has talked about that yet. If a BBC that reaches millions and millions of users every day is not afraid of using newest technology out there in their pages and they have to support really old browsers, then we should not be the ones saying like, okay, I made an experiment because I cannot use that in my day-to-day -day job. This is the kind of things we should be applauding, we should be celebrating rather than celebrating ourselves all the time. It also shows one thing that open should not mean harder. A lot of open source solutions and a lot of open technology solutions are much, much harder to use than closed technology. And this is not how we're going to win that fight. We should not have to step through like five steps to do something to use the open technology. We should be easier to use than Flash and easier to use than Silverlight and not just be, oh yeah, you need to be a hacker to put that thing together. So whenever you find something or you find yourself releasing something open source and you find that it's really hard to use, spend some time to make an editor around it. Spend some time to make a wizard to allow people to click it together in three clicks rather than reading the documentation and writing 400 lines of JSON. It makes no sense to make it harder for us to release open source and open web technology things. We have to win hearts and minds and not just celebrate that it's open. So when people ask me, one, when can I use this stuff? One of the loveliest things in the book is a sign that says, today's the tomorrow you expected yesterday. And that should be our way of dealing with the web. No, you cannot wait for magic to happen. You have to be a part of it and you want, if you want it to move along. 
abstracting issues into technical stopgap solutions that are not used as stopgap solutions holds us back. Like libraries, polyfills, things that we just use and never ever get rid of again is not a solution that is a stopgap. It's another barrier that we have to overcome when we look at that system a year later and we wonder what you've been doing. So the time is now to make the web better not to actually abstract it into something that only is for us. It should be made better and easier and more beautiful for everybody out there. And this means letting things go. I mean, one of the things we are bad with is letting things go and moving on, when what we cherish doesn't quite work out of the way we want it to. So in the book, the hero lets the thing go and lives with other things. He's not 100% sure if the thing really wants to go in there and if it's going to be happy, but it feels right. He goes with his instincts and he says, okay, the, the thing is not scared of it, so probably it belongs here. And we should do the same thing with the web. One thing we don't do is actually think about retirement. Now, look at this old man in the wheelchair here. Would you actually come up to him and say like, okay, let's go for a run and go to the park and have a massive cool workout. Let's do some cross training and run up and down hills and do some really cool work together. Would you do that? Probably not, because you would think you're crazy. But at the same time, when it comes to us, we do that with Internet Explorer 6. Every time we release something cool or we see something cool, the first request will be, well, this doesn't work in Internet Explorer 6, so my clients won't be able to do it. Well, you know what? Internet Explorer 6 is not meant to show animations in CSS. It's not meant to show WebGL 3D animations. It's not meant to play five songs at the same time or allow people to tween in and out of a map really, really fluently. It's an old, old browser. It's an old man in the corner in a wheelchair that actually needs some oxygen every 10 minutes or else he would not be able to breathe. So give it something that it can understand and give it something that it actually can deal with and don't make it choke on things that actually it will not be happy with. It's time we actually let it retire and it's time we actually don't give it anything that it can't cope with. And if our clients say that's not necessary, that's just not true. Because you cannot have that kind of performance in a browser that's that old. So let's make sure that we don't pester the elderly anymore here. Of course our clients will come up with stupid requests. And I think it's time to actually say no to some of them. A lot of feedback I get from people when talking about great new advancements in the web is that our clients don't understand the need for them and want everything to work the same in all browsers or the environment they have. I think it's time to take a stand there and once and for all explain that the web product that looks the same in every environment is a broken web product and unmaintainable by design. It should not look the same in every browser and on every, on every device. That just doesn't make any sense. The benefit of the web is that it can look good and be workable on all these devices and all these different browsers. That's what we should be aiming for and that's what our job is to explain to clients. And the thing I'm thinking about a lot there is actually think about Mario and think about plumbers. When think about customers and how we deal with them, think about other experts. Would a plumber come to your house and be okay with getting you asked to reuse some of the older plumbing or parts you have lying around? Are you arguing with a plumber about his tools and what he should do? No, you don't, and the plumber will not be happy doing any of that. We are the same. We are craftsmen. We should act like them. We should be proud of our tools and we should be proud of actually not allowing the client to say what we should be doing. So if the client wants to have something that's silly, we, su we should say no and not make it a discussion point. And believe me, this money that comes into actually delivering things we don't want to deliver will come from somewhere else. And these clients will have to re understand that we are craftsmen and we are not people that just do something that they don't want to understand, but at the same time actually uh, listen to their demands. So... This is a journey. Web development is a journey and there is no straight way from point A to point B. The dents in the road and little workarounds are what make it interesting and we cannot compare what we do now to things we did in the past. A lot of what we do is done in the unknown and we all should do is build products that are aware of that and are intelligent enough not to break when things that are not in our control go wrong. 
build flexible products, be flexible on that journey, and you will have a lot of fun. A lot of things we haven't defined yet. For example, what is a web app? One big thing that needs definition right now, although we all happily talk about it, is what is a web app? It's not a native app and it's not the same as a desktop app. It should follow the rules of the web and give us the benefits of an app environment. I don't know what it is yet, but I know that a true web app does not start with you need this browser and this kind of hardware to see this. So let's define that. Let's make things happen. I invite you hereby to come with me on this journey to go out and start your next web project with a different view and outlook. You can create amazing stuff. You just need to free yourself from the idea of being able to control everything and tell users what to do. The web thing strives on independence and choice. It is up to us to build flexible solutions to give users the best they can consume, not the experience we want them to consume. And that's all I had, so thanks for listening.